Just as I am, we have walked me, but that thy blood washed for me, and that thou beest me come to Just as I am for wretched blood, sight is his healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee shall find the land of God.
Good morning. The call to worship can be found in your bulletin if you follow along with me, please. The Lord hears us when we call. Come, and let us put our trust in God. The Lord fills our hearts with gladness. And let us to the, of the, Lord. the Lord grants peace to our weary souls. Please stand if you're able to sing now to hymn number 491. Stand up and bless the Lord. I'm Suzanne Gulick, and I am happy and blessed to be sharing worship with y'all this morning. As we move to a time of confession, confession is to repent, to turn away from sin, and turn toward Christ Jesus. Scripture promises us that when we confess, God hears our cries and wipes away our sins, trusting in God's promises of new life let us confess our sins and the sin of the world. Risen Christ, we are often troubled by our doubts, but you are not troubled by them. You do not require perfect understanding. Instead, you reveal yourself to us again and again, that we might come to know you. Forgive us when our doubts keep us stuck when fear prevents us from loving all creation as you call us to do. Help us to accept the peace you so graciously offer to us. Have mercy on us when we hoard or hide it, when we fail to offer it to others. Renew us and make us whole in this world's strife. We may be bearers of your peace. In resurrection, hope we, we pray. Amen. Take a few moments to confess your personal things in silence. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Children of God, claimed by God, forgiven of our sins, and set free. Alleluia. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Dina Sout, and I'm the Director of Christian Education here at First Presbyterian Church. It's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are worshiping here with us in person and those of you who are worshiping with us online. Uh, if you are online and you have not yet uh, gone out to fpcconroe.org, there you will find our uh, weekly announcements and well, uh, weekly order of worship and our weekly announcements for the things that are going on in the life of the church. I uh, have a few things to remind us of. I have a sticky note for Mr. Mark over here. I'm just going to leave right there just to make sure that he remembers some important things. Just want to make sure that you mark your calendars, please. Uh, April 21st, we were going to have our Memorial Library dedication, and our library committee did such an amazing job on that library. If you have not had an opportunity to go in there yet, it's beautiful. It's, uh, I encourage you to stop by there. But we will have a dedication to the library in honor of uh, uh, Patricia Izell and, uh, during the 11 o'clock service, and we will have a reception after the 11 o'clock service and an open house tour of the library at that time. It is open, it is available to have books checked out, so I encourage you all to come by that day and check, uh, check out the amazing work that our library committee did. It was just absolutely beautiful. The only other thing I want to make sure that you um, have on your calendar is uh, the great canine follicle debacle. And if you're curious about the characters that we have, uh, on the welcome desk out here, Officer uh, Josh Broussard is uh, guarding them for me. But there, it's the description of the characters. We have multiple characters. And what we're going to do it a little bit differently this year. Instead of an individual being the character, we will have tables set up. And each table will represent a character in the mystery. And so this will give an opportunity for you all to get your teams together. I know how competitive we are, so encourage your friends. You can, the tables are set up for eight. We can squeeze 10 people in there. Um, if you, you really want to get comfortable, we could squeeze 12 people per table. But just uh, get your teams together. Decide if you want to go ahead and look at the characters that are there. If you want to let me know if you have a particular character that you speaks to you. It's your... It's your um, what we, your spirit animal, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, let me know, and I'll be happy to assign that character, character to your table. But it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great food. It's going to be great fellowship. And I apologize. It does say I'm offering pre-sale tickets. I don't have any tickets. I do take money, though. So if you want to pre-sale... <laughs> prepay for your dinner uh, you can catch me either you can email me you can pay online and just let me know that you've done so uh, you can catch me after the service before the service and um, we're more than happy to take your money and if you're not able to make it to the dinner we're more than happy to still take your money you can always make a donation so and with that mr. mark I believe you have a few words to say thank you thank you I know y'all are tired of seeing me but uh, so I I'm, I'm gonna surprise you Many of you may not know that I am bilingual. I am. I speak reasonably good English, but I am fluent in Texan. <laughs> so in Texan, who don't love a good who done it? Right? So um, I want to talk a little bit about why we do some of the things that we do. So you guys know that this is our major fundraiser of the year, this and the chili cook-off, to help us offset expenses for our mission trips, for our meals at the Spark, for outings with our youth, for the things that just help grow our children in Christ. And you've heard me say it before many times, we go on these mission trips to change other people's lives, and we do. But what happens in the meantime is it changes us in some very deep and profound ways. Some years ago, I was in Crown Point, New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation there. That is a level of poverty that perhaps some of us will never understand. The family that we went to help lived in the middle of nowhere. 
In order to get a cell phone signal, there was one spot in the desert that you could walk so many paces and you could stand there. If you moved, you lost the signal. I know because I did it. His family had three children, young, living in, oh, you can say a squalor. And we were helping to put a roof on their house because their roof leaked. But what I saw out of those little children the whole week we were there was nothing but smiles. They played with us. They laughed with us. And I know that it had a real impact on the youth that went because it made them realize how incredibly blessed we are, that we live in a bubble. We don't have to live the way many people do, without electricity, some of them without food. A couple of years ago, we were in Oklahoma City in a food desert. That was a term I had never heard. What is a food desert? Well, the nearest grocery store to this particular community was a 20-minute drive away. No big deal, you say. They didn't have a car. Nobody in the community owned a car. It was three hours by bus. You can't buy milk. You can't buy meat. You can't buy anything perishable because by the time you get home, it's spoiled. We went to help build a garden for them so that they could grow their own produce. These are the things that I wish that you could see what we see when we take these young people out, how adaptive they are. We were on our way to Knoxville, Tennessee in the epic event of two nights of broken down buses and it was a blast. The kids adapted. We got there, we did all the work that was required of us to do and more. And I just want you to know how, how much we appreciate you. I also know I don't, I don't know if anybody's happened to notice or not, um, the price of eggs is a little higher than it used to be. Anybody notice that? So if you can't give a thing, I don't care. Come. Enjoy it with us. Have dinner with us. Enjoy the fellowship. If you can give, we greatly appreciate you. More than anything, I just want you to know how much we love you. And we give thanks for you every day. Now it's a time in our service where we set aside for God his tithes and our offerings. I remembered. <laughs>
Please bow your head. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the good that you allow us to have. We're thankful for First Presbyterian Church, for the people who are here, and for the goodness that they create. God, lead and direct us. Make us better Christians each day. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from Acts 3, 12 through 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though our own power or piety we have made, we have had made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant people, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked us to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God 
raised from the dead. To this we are witness, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would, su would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, that his sins be wiped away. And the second scripture reading is 1 John 3, 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us that we sh should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do, what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all that and all who have this power in his in his in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sins is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he has revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. This time we're ready to ask Miss Dina to come back for children's time. I feel like I'm back in eighth grade with all these books. Hold them there. All right. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I have, so if I were to tell you all that I have a ball in this bag, how sure are you that there is a ball in this bag? Fairly sure? It's a better answer than I expected for my own child. What's that, Dylan? I agree with him on that one. Hmm, these two know me. All right. They, they're not so sure that there is a ball in the bag. So, Haley, can you feel the bag? Can you feel You Squish it. Give it a good squish. Now, if, do you think there's a ball in the bag? Squish it again. You think there's a ball in the bag? Just by feeling it, you think there's a ball in the bag? Okay, well. You think it's a hard ball? I'm going to let you in on a secret. What do you think? You think there's a ball in the bag? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so Jocelyn says there's a ball in the bag. Are you going to take her word for it? Yeah. Because she looks very sweet and innocent, right? So the reason I'm talking about this is I know that you all remember we just had Easter or celebrated Easter a couple of weeks ago. And during that time, we learned about the uh, arrest of Jesus and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, right? And that's the day that we celebrate Easter because Jesus is risen, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens after that? Well, I'm glad you asked, Miss Jocelyn. So after that, the disciples had just witnessed Jesus being arrested and he hadn't done anything wrong. Even Pilate said, I have 
find no fault in this man. But the people said, arrest him anyway. And so they did, and they crucified him for nothing, for being a good person. And so his disciples, who had been following him, were scared. And they were all hiding. They went in this room, in this attic, basically, and they were hiding. And they were scared that they might be arrested next. But you know what happened? Jesus appeared in front of them in this locked room where they were. At first, they were a little bit scared because they thought he was a ghost. But then he revealed himself to them. And he said, do you have something to eat? I'm hungry. And so they gave him some food. And when's the last time you ever saw a ghost need some food? Ghosts don't eat food, do they? No. So they, they realized that the risen Jesus was with them in the room there with them. However, there was one that was not in the room there with him. His name was Thomas. And even though his disciples, Jesus' disciples, whom Thomas had been with for years, he knew them. He had even heard from Jesus' own words, own mouth, what was going to happen to him. Thomas still didn't believe, even when the disciples said he was right here in the room with us. He didn't believe them. He said, in fact, I'm not going to believe until I can see him with my own two eyes and I can put my hand in the holes in his wound and then I'll know that he is Jesus. Well, of course, as Jesus does, he did appear again. And this time Thomas was there. And this time Thomas was able to verify with his own two eyes and by touching him that this was the risen Jesus. And after that, they all had the confidence and the strength and the assurance that Jesus would do what he said he was going to do. And they were out in the streets and they were preaching God's word and they were preaching about Jesus' promise and everything. So I know that in today's world, we get to meet a whole lot of doubting Thomases. And I hear people say it all the time. I will believe in your Jesus when you can show him to me. Well, the good news is we can show Jesus to people. This is not just the word of some men that decided to write a feel-good story. This is actually the words of people who could feel Jesus' presence in their lives, whether he, they could physically see him or not. And there's people, eyewitness accounts of people who actually laid their eyes and their hands on Jesus and they wrote about it. And that's how we know Jesus is real. And that's how we can introduce other people to Jesus is by his word in here. Now, I don't expect you guys to break open the old King James version of the book. Audrey's looking at me saying, I'm not sure that I'm going to read that. But the good news is they do have other Bibles for guys your age. That's really, really good. It's a study Bible. And this is probably a little bit older for you, but it's for my older kids and it's really good. And it's called the Kids Quest Study Bible. But for my little ones, we also have beginner's Bibles. And these are really good for my little kids, my little, my little friends. And it tells the story that we, the stories that we need to know in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's the way that when people say, show me your Jesus, when you can show him to me, I can, then I'll believe you. Well, then that's how you're going to show him to your people that are doubting you, to your doubting Thomases, by getting to know God's word. And the only way we're going to get to know God's word is through scripture. Isn't that right, Miss Jocelyn? Yeah. So it's important that we have our Bibles and that we spend time in our Bibles and reading them. Isn't that right? Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, God, we give you thanks thanks for your word, for your your son, Jesus. Jesus. And we pray pray. that we can convince convince all the doubting Thomases of your love love. and your grace grace. and eternal salvation. salvation. Amen. Amen. Good job, guys. I'll see you up here next week.
Let us continue our worship with scripture from Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 and forward. Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they might be seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. This is the word of the Lord. I am quite happy to be with y'all, and I want to apologize up front. I've been traveling, so I'm a little hoarse. So. Hang with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we may in some way grasp the significance of your sacrificial saving grace for we, the undeserving sinners. Jesus, this morning I also ask you to grant me the words to touch our spirits with the message you desire for each of us to hear. Amen. Good morning again. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Suzanne Gulick. I'm an ordained Presbyterian minister of word and sacrament, and I am a recently retired trauma chaplain from Texas Children's Hospital in the Medical Center. And I am happy to be worshiping with you this morning. When we looked at our scriptures for today, so many things flew through my mind. There were so many important, life-altering messages presented all at the same time, all being demonstrated in ordinary, plain, and relatable situations. I started my study for this lesson and these sermons by reading a reflection by the Reverend Dr. Jill Duffield. Reverend Duffield is one of my favorite, all-time favorite authors and practical Presbyterians. She has a way of taking even the most difficult topics and theological teachings and bringing them straight down to relatable ideas and situations so vital to the practice of our daily faith and walk with Jesus. Reverend Duffield begins her discussion of these passages with the tale of a little girl and her mother's continual admonitions with a recurring phrase. Now this really tickled me because it was the same phrase that my sister, myself, and my friends heard from our parents and some of the other adults in our lives growing up. You know better, so do better. You know better, so do better. We heard that phrase at school. We heard it at home if we didn't give school the proper focus, at the dinner table, at Girl Scout meetings, at church, and you get the idea. 
the thinking behind that phrase, you know better, so do better, is that once you learn a certain new knowledge, you should incorporate it. You should use it. But Reverend Duffield reminds us that the reality, of course, is often that our knowledge and our behavior don't match. Even that pillar of the early church, Paul, he confessed in Romans, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep doing. Knowing, even wanting to do what is right and good doesn't necessarily mean we actually do it. So, in fact, sometimes we do the exact opposite. And as Duffield further reminds us, that knowledge is in fact an irreplaceable factor in the equation for a life lived with intentional integrity. I really like that phrase, intentional integrity. The truth is, Ignorance may be bliss for the person who's ignorant, but for those who have to live in that person's orbit, they don't claim the same. Bliss is definitely not the description they give. So let's look a little closer at today's scriptures. <clears throat> it appears that teaching and plain old Bible study are central to the text that we read this the third Sunday of Easter. We read where Peter takes advantage of the attention that he received by doing the healing at the beautiful gate. He addresses the crowd and teaches, saying, why do you wonder at this? He carefully tells the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection and connecting the dots between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesus. And in a bold and rhetorical move, Peter implicates those listening in Jesus' murder. But he does this with an important statement. I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. Now, Duffield calls this the ultimate example of, you didn't know better. And through your ignorance, though, God fulfilled the prophets and the Messiah suffered. But now, Peter admonishes the crowd, saying, now you know better. You know better because we, the witnesses of these truths, are teaching, preaching, preaching, sharing this story and filling in the blanks. We are teaching what we have learned so that you too can know better and do better. Repent and be forgiven. So the prime takeaway from this lesson is to learn and live. The irreplaceable factor in the equation for living a life of intentional integrity is knowledge, and knowledge is power. It is God's power if you are willing to act on what you now know. When we examine the passage in Luke again, we see a Bible study, but it's being taught by the risen Christ. As Duffield pointed out previously, This scene for many of us is both extraordinary and simultaneously simply familiar and typical, especially for those of us who attend Sunday morning worship or Wednesday evening services or Bible studies in our local congregations. This morning, for example, we probably have a combination of folks in various stages of their faith journeys and experiencing many different emotions, just like those that were gathered when Jesus revealed himself. We, like they, are fallible and more or less faithful folks, 
gathered together as followers of Jesus. Some are further along in their journey, in their faith journey, and some know more, and some are more confident that this may be a meaningful meeting and meaningful gathering today. Regardless, these believers, with a barrel full of emotions, are together, and shocker, Jesus shows right up, right in the middle of them. Jesus tells them not to be afraid, and he offers his peace. He invited them to touch his hands and his feet so that they could understand that he was real and really the risen Christ. And then, and then, he asked for something to eat, clearly because ghosts don't eat. So clearly, church gatherings and food have gone together since the beginning. Presbyterian potlucks have deep roots. Who knew? But Duffield declares, Bible study and table fellowship go together. Scripture and snacks are virtually inseparable because spiritual and physical nourishment go hand in hand. The risen Jesus, not a ghost, wanted something to eat, and then he opened their minds to understanding scripture. He went on to tell the story, his story, God's story, and now their story too. It is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Learn and live. You know better, so do better. Knowledge is power, God's power, if you are willing to act out of the truth you now know. Since the beginning, these things we still today, especially in today's world, understand and relate. We relate to these things, Bible study, food, small gatherings of unremarkable people, engaging in and with scripture, telling the story of Jesus' life, death, resurrection. We, like those before us, are listening, wondering, and asking questions. Duffield shared that it's the disciples and their teaching that open possibilities and demonstrate that ignorance is not inevitable, that knowledge of God is joy, and that joy is so much better than oblivious or fleeting bliss. Totally typical Sunday school, table conversations and storytelling, made absolutely extraordinary through the power and presence of the risen Christ, the one in our midst whenever two or three are gathered. So Peter and the writer of 1 John and the living risen Christ, our Lord, exhort us, learn and live. So many times we have acted out of ignorance, just as now there are often times that we do not act out on what we know. We're like Paul. We do the very things we hate again and again. But now there is a difference. We know this. The life, the death, the resurrection of Christ enables us to have repentance and forgiveness of sins. Peter and the disciples remind us that they were witnesses to this. They know it by heart in their hearts, and they were able to experience that amazing grace firsthand. 
and because they know that they are called to proclaim the truth, others can learn and live too. It's through Jesus Christ and the words of 1 John that we learn, Beloved, we are God's children now. What will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Live, learn, live. Claim this truth and the power of this knowledge. Repent, be forgiven, and just as you have been forgiven, you should forgive others. Remember and know these truths. You are beloved children of God. And as such, be reminded that we are called to tell and to teach this truth to others so that that which we have witnessed, they too will come to know. They too will know that they are beloved children of God, forgiven and freed, no longer ignorant, but aware of the presence and the power of the Most High God. I love the way Reverend Duffield concluded her reflection. It was plain, practical, powerful. She says, hold a typical, extraordinary Bible study in the church, on the streets, at the portico beside the beautiful gate, in the park, at the coffee shop, around your kitchen table. Get people's attention through healing acts of love and service. Offer some food. Tell the story, the story of Jesus, God's story, our story. The story written and enacted for all of creation. Teach and learn and live. Know better. Do better. Know better. Don't do better. Repent. Repeat. Keep learning, trusting God's promise that just like he told Jeremiah, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Such knowledge, it's overwhelming, it's explosive, it's amazing, and it's truly joyous. And far too fabulous for us to keep to ourselves. So, as we move forward into this week and beyond, I want you to think about what it is that you learned in Bible studies or group studies, and how do you share that? How do you share the story of your faith, of our faith, and Jesus' story with others? Please pray with me. Gracious, loving, almighty God, we praise and thank you for your steadfast love and forgiveness. We are grateful for the witnesses that came before us and their willingness and boldness to share your truth. Grant us that same spirit that we may share your love and story with others. Amen. We are going to move in worship to a time of prayer for the people. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? God of abundant grace, we gather today just as your first disciples gathered in the wake of the resurrection in joy and wonder and disbelief. 
we remember that whenever we gather in your name, you appear in our midst, offering us the comfort of your presence and the assurance of your love. And we give you thanks that like those first disciples, you give us a community to practice our faith. Grant us grace to hold space for one another's doubts and questions. Give us courage to admit that we do not have all the answers. Make this community where we explore what it means to receive your forgiveness and dedicate our lives to you. We remember, we remember that when the risen Christ first appeared to his disciples, he offered them peace. Our world is deeply in need of your peace. Oh God, a peace that is not only the absence of conflict, but the presence of wholeness for all people. We pray for the innocent victims of war and terror in Israel, the Ukraine, Central America, Gaza, Africa, and the Middle East, and all around the world. Put an end to violence, Lord. Teach us to recognize our shared humanity, our shared status as your beloved children, each of us created in your image. Lead each of us to prioritize peace, both in our homes and in our communities and the wider world. We pray for all who sit in seats of power, fill their hearts with compassion and their decisions with wisdom, that we may all have the chance not only to survive, but to flourish. Most of all, God, save us from despair. Open our eyes to see the signs of resurrection life that are all around us. Plant hope within us and help us to nurture its tender shoots that grow more robust each day. May we begin to imagine the future of your shalom. Loving Lord, we pray for members of our community that need your care. Ease the suffering of the sick. Speed the healing of those recovery. Comfort all those who mourn and bring rest to all who are worn down. Surround the isolated with love and soothe the troubled minds of the anxious. We especially pray for those we know now by name or in the quiet of our hearts. Lord of life, remind us of our call to love one another as you have loved us with a love that casts out fear and creates community. Grant us energy to serve one another with humility and hope. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes again and all things are made new. We pray in this name and in his name as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It has been an honor and a pleasure to worship with you this morning. I want to close by a very old benediction from Teresa of Avila. As you go out from this place, remember that Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Together, we are the resurrected body of Christ in the world. And whenever, wherever we go, however we live into that call, the risen Christ will be with us. God's love will surround us and the spirit will breathe new life into our weary souls. Amen.